My name is Christian Hudak, and I'm the executive director of the Dunhuang Foundation. And uh, this is the second of our online lecture series. And the focus of this series is mostly on religions of the Silk Road. Today's presentation is a bit of a departure from that. Um, we're actually quite lucky to have um, the Foster Foundation Curator of Chinese Art from the Seattle Art Museum, uh, Ping Fong, here with us today. Uh, and she'll be speaking actually on uh, provenance, uh, which is a, a, a really important uh, concept uh, in art history and also the collecting of art, uh, but one that we actually don't really uh, get to talk about very often here at the foundation. Um, so her talk is going to center on uh, a piece that is in the Seattle Art Museum's collection that uh, has actually been traced to the library cave at Dunhuang. Uh, or at Mogao. So for those of you that are familiar with the library cave um, in its history, uh, it was uh, discovered actually 120 years ago back in June. So uh, we are uh, celebrating an anniversary of sorts or uh, rather um, taking part in a celebration of uh, that discovery um, here in the US by uh, having this talk. Uh, and I think it's a, a really fascinating uh, topic and one that I personally am not as aware of. Uh, and I feel very fortunate to have uh, my friend and colleague Ping um, speak with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to shift the table over to, to Ping and allow her to uh, speak to you about her lecture topic today. And uh, after that, um, my colleague, Julia Grimes, the uh, deputy director of the foundation, will do a Q and A with, uh, with Ping and, uh, if you have any questions during this uh, talk, there is a Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen. You can send in those questions for us and we will um, essentially sort through those and present those to Ping for the last part of the lecture. So again, without any further ado, uh, here's Ping and thank you so very much for participating today. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. And um, my name is Feng Ping. I'm the Foster Foundation Curator of Chinese Art at the Seattle Art Museum. And uh, it's my pleasure to join the Dunhuang Foundation uh, for your series. Uh, even as an interloper, um, I will not be talking about religion, but about uh, the provenance of a, a piece of uh, a, a Buddhist Sutra manuscripts that is uh, currently in the collection of the Seattle Art Museum. So let me now share my screen. I hope you can all uh, hear me well. Um, the uh, COVID pandemic, I think it's safe to say right now, has surely caused uh, all sorts of upheavals in our lives. Um, but it offered one rather unexpected upside to me, which is fewer days filled with commuting and meetings. Uh, and with that, some focus time for research. With a little bit of perseverance, uh, not to mention an incredible amount of good luck on Google, I was able to resolve questions about the provenance of a Tang Dynasty Buddhist Sutra manuscript uh, that I would like to uh, speak with you about tonight. So I would like to share some of those findings with you. Um, this will be, in fact, the very first time I have spoken on this research. So. Thank you very much for this opportunity to work through uh, some of my thoughts. Um, my story actually begins in 2016 when the Seattle Asian Art Museum uh, held an exhibition titled Journey to Dunhuang, Buddhist Art of the Silk Road Caves. And before I explain a little bit more about that, I want to recap uh, some of the basics perhaps just to set the stage. Uh, even though I'm sure most of you uh, are already more than familiar with some of this historical background. Um, Dunhuang, of course, uh, as you know, was this ancient city located at the convergence of the northern and southern caravan routes of the Silk Roads. And it was an oasis, a center of trade, um, but it was an outpost, a very long way away from the capital of central China and surrounded on all sides by extreme harsh terrain. And so the Gobi Desert, of course, lay northeast of Dunhuang, and the Taklamakan Desert lay to its west. From the 4th to the 14th century, Dunhuang was a mecca of art and worship. And the many religions practiced there were really as divergent as its residents and travelers, which included pilgrims, monks, nuns, traders, merchants, 
there were Taoists and Nestorians, there were Zoroastrians, Manichaeans, Muslims. The primary religion that flourished at Dunhuang for a thousand years was Buddhism. And near Dunhuang was a rock cliff named Mo Gao, the peerless caves where hundreds of caves were excavated over a millennium as temples. As you can see here uh, in this view on your left, uh, cliffside view, some of the caves. A few of the temples were grand halls housing gigantic Buddhas like the one to the right. So uh, hidden behind this later facade, a multi-story uh, Buddha sculpture, 116 feet tall and still standing today. There were also temples that were merely small niches where only a single person could squeeze in to practice their faith. Uh, at the site of Mokao alone, and there were a few sites uh, in this area near Donghuang, there were uh, 500 caves decorated with murals and about 2,400 stucco sculptures. These sacred spaces were decorated with wall frescoes, stucco sculptures, uh, showing scenes from Buddha's life. Um, the splendidly painted mural images of the paradises that awaited believers survive, uh, they survive um, in slightly faded glory. In the heyday of Dunhuang, beginning in the early Tang Dynasty, uh, aristocrats also began to sponsor caves to excavate the rock cliff and to hire artists to financially support the opening of the caves. And we, this is richly documented. Uh, cave 321, uh, that you see here uh, was quite possibly sponsored by the powerful Tang Dynasty Empress Wu, Wu Zetian, who would rule China as his only female emperor. After 1000 years of efflorescence, Mo Gao waned along with the sucro trade and eventually the caves were forgotten. As Chris just mentioned, the most important perhaps to scholars is the library cave. This was, uh, the Donghuang was forgotten until the early 20th century and perhaps to be more precise, on the evening of June 22nd of the year 1900, the Taoist monk Wang Yuanlu made an important discovery. Uh, this is him depicted in a 1907 photograph. Abbot Wang was the unofficial guardian of the Mogao caves. Uh, who found ways to solicit donations in order to raise money to maintain the temples and to restore statues. On that date, 1900, while clearing sand from cave 16, this workman accidentally discovered a hollow wall along a passageway. Removing the wall, they found a hidden door right there. This door led into a small cave that contained thousands of ancient manuscripts and paintings dating from the fourth to the 11th centuries. It had originally been constructed as a memorial cave for the local, a local monk after he died in the ninth century. You can see here the monk's sculptural portrait in this color photograph uh, moved back inside after all the contents were removed. The memorial cave was later filled from top to bottom with stacks and bundles of scrolls and paintings, and then finally sealed up in the 11th century for reasons unclear and still being actively debated by scholars. The sensational discovery of Cave 17 founded an entire new field of medieval studies called Dunhuangology, first in China, then Japan, Europe, and America with literally thousands of articles and hundreds of monographs published. And I hope to add my own modest contributions to that list based on my studies of two objects in the Seattle Art Museum collection. Indeed, Cave 17's contents are reckoned priceless today. Certainly many artifacts found or excavated in China in the first decades of the 20th century have now acquired status as national treasures. And as one scholar puts it, quote, Dunhuang manuscripts are at the top of the list, unquote. But at the time of Abbot Wang's discovery, it meant little to those around him. More often they regarded the old yellowed manuscripts as just useless old paper. Nevertheless, Wang didn't give up offering them to various local government officers as proof of his discovery and these gifts also serve to cultivate personal favor for this former soldier turned Taoist monk and self-declared caretaker of the Mogao cave temples. 
Some scholars propose a larger purpose that his gifts help gain the support of local officers from exempting Dun Huang area farmers from punitive grain purchase taxes that were established uh, since the Qianlong period and which later led to a peasant revolt. One of the earliest persons that Abbot Wang contacted was the circuit intendant, the Dao Tai of Suzhou, a Manchu official named Yan Dong, who was a scholar. So the abbot loaded a crate full, traveled from Mogao right here to Suzhou right here. And this is a journey of about 400 kilometers from the cave. So those of you who are familiar with the, this area, this, the geography of this area, this is uh, known as uh, a Jiuquan today, present day Jiuquan. But uh, even this Yandong did not ascribe any great value to the manuscripts that were shown to him, purportedly saying that his own handwriting was better than on the pieces that Abbot Wang showed to him. It was actually the painter Xie Zhiliu who had reported this news based on stories that he heard when he was visiting the Mogao caves uh, between 1942 and 1943. Um, so by this time, the impression of Abbot Wang's uh, motives were less than favorable, portraying him as somebody hoping to make money from his discovery of Cave 17's contents. So here's a translation of some of what Xie Zhiliu, an excerpt for what Xie Zhiliu wrote. Abbot Wang was quite sly and tried to make some money with his discovery. He secretly loaded his case with scrolls, shipping them to Jiuquan, where he presented those to the Manchu Yandong, the circuit intendant of the Ansu circuit, the Anxi Suzhou circuit. Yandong did not realize what these were. He thought the calligraphy of the scrolls was inferior to his own and did not value them. Abbot Wang felt greatly disheartened, but he left the manuscripts behind and he returned home. In this excerpt, Xie Zhiliu also notes clearly that some manuscripts passed from hand to hand, uh, from the Manchu official Yandong, eventually to this person, a Belgian man from the tax office at Jiayiguan, um, that is, Jiayiguan is very close to Suzhou right here. And then from then, he, this Belgian man, then offered it to various people uh, after traveling westward to Xinjiang province. I cannot overemphasize the great cultural art historical and religious significance of the Mogao caves, not to mention the specific importance of cave 17, so-called library cave. Yet, Dunhuang was eventually abandoned over the centuries. During the late Qing dynasty in the 19th century, few willingly went to China's Western regions given, given the harsh living conditions. And some of them were sent there in exile by the Qing court. And it was really only in the early 20th century when European explorers brought attention back to Dunhuang and the subsequent realization by Chinese scholars in Beijing of its importance. One of the first foreigners to arrive at Dunhuang in 1907 was Sir Oral Stein, at left, who led a total of four expeditions to Chinese Central Asia. And uh, here is a uh, this photograph that I showed you of Abbot Wang that I just showed you uh, was taken by Stein when uh, he visited Dunhuang in 1907. Uh, this photograph that I'm showing you right here uh, is, shows Stein here with his uh, Chinese secretary and his uh, three Indian and one Uyghur assistant and his dog Dash. The only other foreigner predating Stein who certainly heard about Cave 17's discovery, but may or may not have actually visited Mokao, was the Belgian tax collector mentioned in Xie Zhiliu's account. The next foreign visitor was Paul Pellio, who arrived in uh, 1908, uh, one year after Stein, and uh, Pellio was able to procure even more works from the library cave. Pellio, of course, had the advantage of being a sinologist and a polyglot, and he was able to read the documents. He knew what he was getting. Pellio spent three weeks reading in the cave, as you can see uh, in this very famous photograph on the right. The Stein and Pellio expeditions soon led to the dispersal of Dunhuang collections outside of China. 
After his second expedition, uh, Orlstein returned to Europe with a trove of manuscripts, silk scrolls and banner paintings from Cave 17, acquired for a exceedingly modest sum from Abbot Wang. This example on the left uh, is a very fine painting of a high class Tang Dynasty lady, perhaps depicting her soul that is floating on a cloud being led to paradise by a bodhisattva now held at the British Museum. The Stein manuscripts are today held at the British Library. Paul Pelliot's expedition brought back to France statues, frescoes, objects, over 200 paintings and banners now at the Musée Guimet. These two examples on the right are very rare wood painted Tang Dynasty guardian kings. They were shown in Mimi Gate's spectacular Cave Temples of Dunhua exhibition that opened at the Getty in 2016. These works preserved in Cave 17 hints at the wide variety of materials used for Buddhist worship that no longer exist in the caves. They included wood sculptures, silk textiles, banners, priestly vestments, uh, and sutras in many different languages, some of which were multilingual that once found uses at Mogao. Eventually, other adventurous visitors began to make their way to this ancient desert outpost. Around the middle of the 20th century was when Chinese scholars and artists also started traveling to Dunhua to better understand these splendid cave temples. Artist Zhang Da Qian, who arrived in 1941, even attempted to repair and to make replicas of Mogao cave murals. Here he is on the right doing some in painting. On the left is his copy of a cave mural from the Yulin Caves, which is not so far from Mogao Caves. You'll remember the world at this time was in the midst of World War II. Zhang Qian, who stayed for nearly 30 years, uh, sorry, three years, not 30. He stayed for nearly three years. Uh, and during his stay, he invited Xie Zhiliu to join him in 1942. Uh, like Zhang Qian, Xie Liu made copies of cave murals during his time there. And Xie also wrote down local stories about Cave 17, eventually publishing uh, those stories um, at, at very valuable records, including the excerpt that I just read to you. Soon to follow, Zhang Da Qian and Xie Zhiliu, the couple, James Lo and his wife, Lucy, Luo Jimei and Liu Xian, uh, they arrived in 1943. James was a photojournalist for the Central News Agency, and he had taken a year's leave to photograph Dunhua. Lucy was also a photographer, and she remains hale and hearty today. If it were not for COVID, I would not have missed her 100th birthday celebration this year. In 2016, the Seattle Asian Art Museum organized an exhibition with Princeton Art Museum about James and Lucy Lowe's meticulous documentation of what the caves looked like before the Cultural Revolution. And the show was also about the technical virtuosity, the aesthetic sensibilities of their wonderful photographs. It also included the sutra and paper fragments that they collected, some of which, Lucy tells me, they literally picked up from the desert floor during their 18 month stay. We also included their own artistic renditions in full scale paintings, one of which we borrowed for our exhibition poster that I'm showing you on the left. The exhibition at the Seattle Asian Art Museum eventually ended, but something of long lasting significance occurred as a result. During the run of the show, I had given a talk about Dunhua to members of the museum. And it so happened that one person in the audience mentioned uh, my talk to his father. And his father then wrote to me a letter saying, quote, I have a page of scripture that may be from the Mogao caves at Dunhua, unquote. This distinguished gentleman and I then corresponded for over a year about his manuscript, and he generously offered it to the museum as a gift. In one letter to me, he charmingly made a plea for the museum to take over care of the scroll, saying that, quote, the manuscript probably left China around 1938 and has been in Hawaii in a trunk with mothballs and at ambient temperatures and humidity ever since, unquote. During that year of correspondence, we furiously researched the manuscript in all its dimensions. 
I worked on the art historical aspects and my colleague, Geneva Griswold, our associate conservator at the Seattle Art Museum helped me on the science. We decided on taking a period size sample from this little piece on the upper right, all hanging on for dear life, literally by a thread. And we sent that sample to a Harvard laboratory for fiber analysis. And the laboratory determined that nearly all of the fibers are off the Moraceae or Almacea family, uh, happily consistent with published reports conducted on British Library manuscripts. We had to tread very carefully indeed, knowing of the many, many possible difficulties that lay ahead to determine if it was possible to acquire this work for the museum, given what we know of all the major issues. First, of course, is the known issue of forgeries of Dunhuang manuscripts, as well documented by Susan Whitfield and her colleagues. And secondly, the provenance or the history of ownership, how the piece left China and under what circumstances. While my colleague was organizing the lab test, I got to work. The first thing I evaluated was related to its artistic merit. Uh, and I find it to be an excellent work of art. I date it to around the Tang Dynasty, uh, around the eighth century in particular, since it is similar to the imperial form of calligraphy that was standardized by the mid seventh century based on this famous calligrapher's elegant handwriting that I'm showing to you on the left, Su so, so, yeah. Sutra copying, of course, is done to gain Buddhist merit, but the handwriting isn't always beautiful. The transcriber of our manuscript was very accomplished in calligraphy. Every character has a sophisticated composition and balance. So you see, for example, his flicking brush tips from tiny finger and wrist movements. You see the varying shapes, for example, of each stroke from thin to thick to thin to add visual interest. You also see, for example, these corner turns executed with some drama and flair, yet done with firmness and precision. In the latter third of the text, which has doubled the number of characters to fit, the writer maintains command and control. Overall, I evaluate it as masterful calligraphy in spite of some unusual orthography here and there, even one or two typos, such as this character, for example. The text itself is a somewhat obscure sutra, originally compiled before the middle of the sixth century and thought to be apocryphal until the discovery of the library cave. Indeed, as people tell me, the obscurity of the sutra is actually a very good sign for its authenticity, since a forger would much more likely copy a popular sutra, like the Soul Lotus Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, maybe even add a date to add extra value to their forgery. The name of the sutra is very long. Uh, Roughly translated as Sutra on the Solemn Attainment of Buddhahood by means of repentance to extinguish sins in a great, thorough, and broad way. Now, this fragment only preserves a very small section of a longer text in three chapters. It is a manual for calling out to Buddha for salvation, something uh, like a recipe book providing combinations of Buddha's many names. It contains instructions for the confession rites, a repentance ritual that one must conduct over seven days without sleep, six times per 24 hours, reciting the entire sutra three times a day. Buddhologists study it in relation to the forms and practices of various uh, Buddha name rites with an especially rich record in the Japanese historical sources. For example, the so-called Hoko uh, Sangha, the rite of confession of 823 celebrated on the 23rd day of the 12th moon in Kyoto when a ritual called the Daitsu Hokoho uh, was performed all night in the hall of the palace by the great master Kukai. This fragment is very rare indeed. Only three 
other early fragments of the sutra from Dunhuang survive. In the 20th century, scholars reconstructed the sutra on the basis of those three Dunhuang fragments, two of which are in Japanese collections with chapters one and two, and the third fragment uh, that came from Oral Stein's second expedition, now in the British Library, preserving chapter three. This makes the Seattle Art Museum piece the fourth extant Dunhuang fragment, and it preserves a small part of chapter two. The British Library Oral Stein manuscript of chapter three is obviously much longer, uh, and I think it was possibly copied a little bit earlier. From a detail of the British Library Sutra at left, we see how the character compositions are slightly squatter, flatter in shape, and the brushwork a little bit plumper, showing much less attenuation. So the, each stroke is a little bit plumper. Uh, it doesn't have the th uh, thin, thick, thin, the flicking tips brush complexity uh, that, we, uh, that was established by the mid seventh century and as seen on the Seattle fragment at right. But there are some similarities too, such as this scalloped top and bottom edges, um, both here due to water damage while rolled up. There is also this dark yellow color of the paper, which is from a dye that functioned as an insect repellent and often used for Buddhist sutras. The material itself can offer a view into authenticity and dating. It's important to factor the size and color of the paper and also the composition of the fiber bust. Since the paper is handheld, we see these very fine, even horizontal laid lines that are as a result of the either bamboo or silk paper making sieve, which makes an impression very specific to the type of paper mold. We can compare with some statistic, uh, statistics available on other dated Dunhuang papers that have already been studied. Scholars suggest that high quality papers may have been produced in inland China and transported westward to Dunhuang for use, but coarser paper was also produced locally. So I await the code ecologists to tell me more. Textual historians and art historians too have a variety of levers to pull in order to get at questions of authenticity and dating. Now, we art historians discuss the style of calligraphy. The text scholars study character orthography and taboo characters. Uh, so this is refers to how writers are sometimes obliged by law to substitute a character or change a stroke here and there when it coincided with the sovereign's name or other taboos. And of course, it remains to be seen if this fragment is uh, any interest to Buddhologists and whether it helps to better understand the rituals and practices described in the sutra text beyond what we already know from the other three copies from Dunhua. Besides all of these techniques, it happens that our manuscript has one additional unique feature. Uh, the fragment came to me mounted together with a very curious document, a gift letter written in English. The note is addressed to Professor Anne Billy. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It could be Bill. I, I, I think of it as a Billy. Uh, and it came from one Rao Yu Ai on May 15th, 1932. So it reads as follows To Professor Anne Billy, this is a piece from one of the rolls of Buddhistic scripture copied by persons in the Tang Dynasty. These rolls were preserved in a stone room among the mountains in Dunhuang, Gansu, and had remained undiscovered until the beginning of the Republic. From Rao Yi Ai, May 15th, 1932. So Rao says that the scroll came from a stone room in Gansu province. That is, she is refer uh, this person is referring to the library cave 17 that I just discussed, the letter therefore provides us with some excellent clues for retracing the scroll's, the scroll's history. Uh, 
So let us begin with the professor who is mentioned. In my research, I was able to tease out quite a bit about all the characters in this very fascinating story. Professor Billy received her BA and MA from Stanford University. She was the first Dean of Fullerton Junior College in California. She then took up the offer of her good friend, Fuk Tan Ching, uh, uh, Chen Fudian, who to move back, to move to China in order to teach English at Tsinghua University in Beijing. She had been Fuk Tan Ching's English teacher when he was a high school student in Honolulu, and she clearly made a strong impression. The two remained friends in the following decades. Professor Billet stayed in China for 11 years from 1923 to 1934, teaching freshman English and supervising upper level theses. She printed a collection of her poems, Broken Tiles, in 1931 in Beijing. Billy's student, Rao Yuai, gave uh, the Dunhuang Scroll a gift, uh, as a gift the very next year, 1932. Tsinghua was a progressive and vibrant university campus that cultivated foreign cultural exchange. Uh, by 1929, it had already sent 1,280 students to study in the United States. At the time, there were nearly 20 foreign professors um, from the United States, uh, Britain, Germany, Switzerland, Russia, and so forth, uh, including Miss Billy, teaching foreign languages, history, mechanical engineering, sociology, political science, Western music, and literature. Billy's tenure overlapped with the famous Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore and Chinese art historian Gustav Ecke and also many French and American physicists, chemists, and mathematicians. After the Sino-Japanese War broke out in 1937, Billy moved to Hawaii to retire, and after illness, she passed away in Honolulu in 1942. Upon her death, Professor Billy bequeathed her Dunhuang scroll to Fuk Tan Jing, who had invited her to China in the first place, and who had by this time served as the chair of the Department of Foreign Languages and Literatures at Tsinghua University three times. As a young man, Fuk Tan had received a master's of education from Harvard. When I spoke to Fuk Tan's son, and this is the distinguished gentleman I mentioned earlier, Fuk Tan's son recounted that his father, quote, like many idealistic second generation American Chinese from Hawaii of his time, went off to help build the new republic." Unquote. So Fuk Tan joined the faculty of Tsinghua University in 1923. This was, you know, this was at age 26. And he remained at Tsinghua for 25 years through thick and thin, through the university moving from one city to another and staying the course through bombing and privation. From his son's recounting, food allowances was so meager that the teachers were sometimes reduced to eating rats. When the pilots of the American volunteer group, the AVG or the Flying Tigers arrived, he was their liaison. And later when the US entered World War II, he trained interpreters for General Stilwell's officers commanding Chinese troops in Burma. And it was not until the communists swept to victory in 1948 that Fuk Tan and his family returned home to Hawaii. That is 1948, this was six years after Miss Billy passed away. Fulton's textbook for freshmen cultivated a whole generation of intellectual elites in liberal arts, including two Nobel Prize winners. This book is still being used. An updated English Chinese bilingual edition was recently published just in 2017. The stories of Professors uh, Anne Billy and Fuk Tan Jing against the sweeping background of wartime experiences is so very fascinating. But for today, I want to head us towards a different direction, namely to investigate the identity of this Rao Yuai. The signature on the gift letter is in English, so this leaves us with a great difficulty since it provides no information about the Chinese characters or pronunciation of the name, nor the person's gender. As you may know, 
uh, Chinese is a tonal language. For example, the word I pronounced in one tone can refer to several different characters, each with different meanings. And there are several tones in, China, in, in Mandarin. So I, 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 different tones, different meanings, and each having different characters. Furthermore, I cannot confirm which Chinese dialect is being expressed in this transliteration. So based on the spelling of Dunhuang, Dunwo, I suspected that the person was using Cantonese rather than Mandarin. And if it were Cantonese, then we are possibly talking about nine different reading tones, each for Yu and I. Furthermore, I'm actually not even sure how to read the cursive of the surname. Is it R-A-O or J-A-O? Yes, no doubt, this is quite the pickle. But the letter does offer several facts. This gift was made by Rao to Professor Billy on May 15, 1932. So we have a date. A second fact is that this person's proficiency in English is excellent, very good at English. Uh, so we might guess that they were likely Billy student at Tsinghua University. And for that matter, look at Rao's very handsome hand in calligraphy. This was a person who was very well trained with a stylus and an ink pot. Perhaps some of you out there were trained to write like this, but not I. This is not easily achievable. I had a little bit of extra time between Zoom meetings and one day in September, I decided to sit down and bite the bullet and really try and solve this problem. Actually, I, what I ended up doing was I sat down with Google for three days straight for eight hours each day, something like what the Sutra had described and offering up a little suffering for my own purpose. I really think that Google ought to endow my position as Google Scholar in Residence. My first move was an educated guess. I happen to know a famous scholar, Rao Zhongyi, whose name is Romanized in exactly these two ways, both as J-A-O and as R-A-O. So let's assume that his Rao is in fact our surname. The problem is that this still leaves me with too many possible permutations. Yu has 231 commonly typed characters, not including the emoji of the fish and the cloud, which are pronounced Yu and Yu. I has 75 commonly typed characters. So this leaves me with 17,325 possible combinations, even if I had guessed the surname correctly. Clearly I needed a better strategy to narrow it down. I mean, logically, while there are 231 use, not all were equally common in names. I went to work inputting combinations of Chinese characters based on Rao's, um, this Rao and different use. So soon I discovered this person, uh, Rao Yitai, who was a famous physicist, the most famous of the early 20th century physicists, which led me to several other early 20th century names regularly appearing with that Rao and Rao Yitai's Yu, this Yu. A name that caught my eye particularly was one of three daughters of a prominent medical doctor. And it caught my eye because she was a translator with international experience. In fact, all of Dr. Rao, all three of Dr. Rao's daughters used the same Yu as their middle character. So I thought, interesting. Eventually with that in hand, I started randomly inputting different eyes from my list of 76 possible eyes. Plus I added Tsinghua University, and foreign language department to my search terms. So perhaps it was a piece of luck that I happened to often use the word I, meaning love. Bingo. 
amazingly, my search using the word love kicked up just one and only one result. It pointed to a book listing all the professors and students who attended Tsinghua University between 1927 and 1949. Rao Yuai was listed as a female graduate of 1933 from the Foreign Languages Department. Her entry in this book on the right lists some of her accomplishments. It turned out to be this medical doctor's daughter after all. After receiving her degree in 1933, Ms. Rao Yuai went on to work as assistant professor of history at Beijing University. Then in the 1940s onwards, she served as an interpreter at various high level cultural and education meetings and at the international conferences. She translated at the Embassy of Greece and twice in Berlin for the International Women's Federation meetings. She died in Beijing in 1981. Therefore, we can ascertain with confidence that Ms. Rao Yai was 20 years old when she made Professor Billy a gift of our Dunhuang scroll while attending Tsinghua University in Beijing, who in turn bequeathed it to Fuk Tanqing, her dear friend and chair of her department at Tsinghua University after Professor Billy passed away in Honolulu, this was 1942, who then gave it to his son after his death in 1953, who then donated it to the Seattle Art Museum in 2016. Being able to identify Rao Yi, needless to say, was very gratifying indeed. But then we might ask, from whom did Miss Rao herself obtain the scroll? So obviously, my next step was to do a little bit more research on her family background. Her father, Rao Feng Huang, was a medical doctor, and I discovered that he was also a devout lay Buddhist. He co-sponsored a Buddhist research organization that promoted teaching, research, and translation, and also engraving of Buddhist scriptures. But that still didn't satisfy me. So I followed the trail of breadcrumbs further backwards in time, which brought me to Miss Rao's grandfather, Rao Yingqi, who turns out was an important person serving in the Qing Dynasty government as provincial governor of Xinjiang province. Xinjiang is the westernmost part of remote Western China that is remote to Beijing, but geographically very close to Dunhua. China's borders were changing in the 19th century. Here's a map, one map of the Qing Empire circa 1820. Here are the provinces in yellow and the military governorates and protectorates in green. The Qing Dynasty conquered the region to its west in 1884 and converted it into a new province as part of China proper, naming it Xinjiang or literally New Frontier. Rao Yinqi, uh, who was Miss Rao Yai's grandfather, served as Xinjiang's third governor. He actually held a joint appointment as governor of neighboring Gansu province as well, right here. And so Dunhuang, right at the tip here, was also under his jurisdiction. Governor Rao's seats were therefore at both the capital of Xinjiang, Urumqi, and also the capital of Gansu province at here, Lanzhou. Furthermore, he held this post exactly during the time of Abbot Wang's discovery of Library Cave 17 on June 22, 1900. Now, Rao Inchi is a very important figure in economic history of the region, having also earlier served as Xinjiang's Minister of Finance. He embraced mining, he used the province's rich mineral wealth to bolster revenue. By 1898, he and agents of the Russian Empire had negotiated for a partnership in a gold mining enterprise in the Katu Mountains on the Russian border, and which by the fall of 1900 had provided 44 pounds of gold, which is quite a large amount. More importantly, I think Rao Inchi's willingness to work with Russia, a source of expansionism and aggression towards the Qing dynasty ever since the mid 19th century, this was an anomaly. 
but it appears in character with his other positive dealings with other foreign explorers, including with the Russian uh, geographer, Pyotr Kozlov, and also with Sir Oral Stein. Oral Stein's activities were Rao's responsibility. Uh, and the scholar Imre Galambos has uh, written about a recently rediscovered 1902 Chinese translation of Stein's preliminary report. The translation was commissioned by Governor Rao, who had a copy of Stein's report. Clearly, Rao was very eager to know more about Stein's excavation results. One other foreigner might be brought back into our discussion at this point. He was quite unlike Oral Stein, not just a visitor uh, passing through, but actually a former resident. We here reach our final piece of the puzzle, which is an investigation into the movements of Paul Spengelt, who had originally arrived at the Catholic mission set up by the papal order in Mongolia. Paul was a colorful figure whose life inspired characters in at least two novels, including Vladimir Nabokov's last novel, The Gift. He had served as translator and guide for the renowned German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen during his travels in China between 1868 and 1872. Uh, Richthofen was the one uh, who coined the term Silk Rose, the Seidenstrasse, published uh, in 1877. Paul then ran a fur and wool trading business in Mongolia, where he married his wife, a Christian Manchu woman, Catherine Lee, with whom he had 13 children, of which 11 survived. So their descendants today number in hundreds, uh, living in China, U the US, Venezuela, and other places. In 1881, Paul was called by Viceroy Li Hongzhang to serve as customs inspector at the far western post of Suzhou in Gansu province, where he also ran a smallpox clinic. He remained in Suzhou for 14 years until 1896. When Paul left Suzhou after 14 years, prominent members of the city offered him gifts, including this parasol on the right covered with accolades. Sorry. Um, this is a very fascinating family photograph that was taken in the Shanghai studio in 1896 called the Zi Ming Studio or the uh, um, Yao Hua Studio, Yao Hua Zhao Xiang. And we see his 11 surviving children here, which is another way to date the photograph. In 2001, sharp eyed scholars uh, Xie Shengbao and uh, Zhao Chongming uh, noticed some of the writing hanging in the back behind the older children, as you can see uh, right here. This turns out to be a resume of his positions. Recall now Xie Zhiliu's description about a, Beijing, a Belgian man from the tax office at Jia Yuguan, translating Paul's titles here, Zhou Pai, Jia Yu Shui Guan, Jian, Niu Dou Ju. So dispatched to the Jia Yu Customs Office of Taxation and concurrently serving the smallpox bureau. Thus, scholars were able to definitively prove that the Belgian man in Xie's account was none other than Paul Spengelt. Since then, Chinese scholars have gen generally evaluated Xie Jiliu's mention of the Belgian as dubious because Paul left his tax office for Shanghai in 1896. Otherwise, how could he have taken this photograph? Thus, making it impossible for him to have known about the discovery of Cave 17 four years later in 1900. From my point of view, this anecdote by Xie Jiliu, even though it was based on reportage of local rumors, may now prove to be closer to oral history than hearsay as it is sometimes characterized. I decided that it was important to dig deeper on this piece of information a decision which led me to seek out an entirely different source of information, namely the letters preserved in Belgian missionary archives. To me, there was one especially interesting detail in Xie Jiliu's description worth my effort to confirm. That is, Xie is quite specific that at the time, Paul was about to return home to his country. 
the CICM missionaries, that is, this is CICM is the Latin for Congregatio Immaculati Cordis Mariae, or the Congregation of the Immaculate Hearts of Mary, is this is a Roman Catholic missionary religious congregation of men established in 1862 by the Belgian Catholic priest Theophile Verbiste. Verbiste was the one who brought Paul to Mongolia in the first place. The CICM archives contains communications in Dutch and French between him and the Schutists or the Schut missionaries. The letters document in some detail the year that I'm especially interested in, namely the eve of the Boxer uprising and the months that framed Abbot Wang's discovery of Cave 17 at Morgau. In 1898, Leopold II decided to send out an expedition to Gansu to buy land and to establish a village there. Paul was engaged at this time as attache of the independent state of Congo to accompany two people, uh, Colonel Gaspard Fivet and also two engineers. Uh, they were named Hanrad and Ladant. And they were on a mission to prospect in Western China, hoping to discover reserves of quartz and gold. Based on the letters in the CICM archives, I was able to put together this rough chronology of Paul's Gansu itinerary with Colonel Fivet in 1900. It is very clear that they arrived uh, in Lanjo in February 17th, and they took one trip out and that trip was a bust due to the weather. Then they left again, took a second trip from Lanjo to Northern Gansu. Uh, that is this area of Anxi and Suzhou that we uh, focused on. So this places it exactly around a time uh, of the discovery of Cave 17 when uh, uh, Abbot Wang sent those scrolls uh, to Yandong, who then passed some to Paul. So uh, the chronology works out perfectly. By August, Paul and Fibé had returned to Lanzhou already, having heard news of the Boxer Uprising's building momentum, and on the way back, they had seen some of its consequences. Within a month, uh, by September 7th, they leave in rather a hurry for outer Mongolia, traversing the frigid Gobi Desert on a caravan of 20 camels. And with the escort of a Mongolian border prince, they make it safely to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, around November. Now, Paul stays in Ulaanbaatar because he is hoping to reunite with his wife, Catherine, who he actually had to leave behind. The rest of the group uh, tra traveled the Trans-Siberian Railway and then onwards to Europe. Thus, my belief that Xie Julius comments that Paul was about to return home to his country must therefore refer to this hurried escape. By the time of their return to Lanzhou in August of 1900, the city was in a ferment and the sense of danger expressed in missionary letters is palpable. In a letter, Springelt's own opinion was that the company's safety in Lanzhou was assured in no small part due to his personal efforts, his personal connections to local officials saying, quote, I went to the governor and the high officials and had a conversation with them, unquote. Indeed, his wife Catherine was taken in by the official's wife and given her uh, given the protection when he left for Mongolia with Colonel Fivet. I must add that local government officer titles are very complex, and in translated sources, it is often quite unclear what governor or viceroy actually referred to in the original Chinese, and sometimes they mix them all up altogether. So it is very important to confirm by cross-reference who is who. Uh, so Oral Stein describes something of the following in his official uh, archeological report, which I blow up here so that you can read it. Um, He is very clear here that the first thing to note that the circuit intended at Suzhou, we know who this is, this is Yandong, 
that Yandong had reported Abbot Wang's discovery to Gansu's uh, viceroy. That is, the viceroy found out about Cave 17 through Yandong. The second thing we can find out from uh, uh, oral signs report is that Abbot Wang told Stein that scrolls had been taken and sent to the viceroy in Lanzhou, where they apparently had failed to attract any interest there. So comparing this record with the missionary letters, we discover that Stein's viceroy of Gansu was actually Wei Guangdao, which the missionary sometimes refer to by the surname as the honorable Wei or as the new governor. Indeed, Wei became viceroy in 1900 and hence was new. Putting together the letters between Paul Spengelt and the Schutis missionaries stationed in Gansu, Oral Signs Serendia Report published in 1921 and Xie Zhiliu's notes from 1942, we may come up with this rough map of the earliest dispersal of manuscripts from Cave 17 after its discovery on June 22, 1900. Abbot Wang gave scrolls to Yandong in Suzhou, who then reported it to Viceroy Wei Guangdao in Lanzhou, the capital of Gansu province. And at some point, it was ordered that the scrolls be taken to the Lanzhou vice regal office. But perhaps even before these scrolls were officially brought to Lanzhou, Paul Springelt passed by Suzhou, his old home where he had served as tax officer for 14 years, and Yandong gave him a few scrolls from his stash. Now, while I have not been able to confirm whether Colonel Fivet's mission traveled uh, to Xinjiang province afterwards, it seems possible based on Xie Zhiliu's report that Paul passed along various scrolls to local officials in Xinjiang. It is thus possible that this was when Rao Yinqi received a gift from Paul in Urumqi. Another possibility is that Rao got his scroll directly from, uh, from Viceroy Wei, who was his superior. Paul and his group arrive back in, by August in Lanzhou and then leave for Mongolia by September. In any case, it is clear that our scroll came into Governor Rao's possession soon after the library cave's discovery in 1900, if not immediately as I have suggested in this diagram, then certainly by 1902. And we know this because the governor is assigned to his next post in 1902. And he packed up his entire household by the end of that year. They must have taken all of the belongings, including his Dunhuang manuscripts. By January of 1903, Governor Rao dies uh, while traveling to his next post. And he dies right here in Hami. At that point, the governor's wife, uh, this her, her maiden name is Wang. Uh, Miss Wang brings the whole family directly to their hometown in Hubei, Enshi Hubei, to, in order to bury the governor there. And this included, the family included Rao Feng Huang, Governor Rao's son, Rao Feng Huang, who was already a young man at age 22. Rao Feng Huang must therefore have known firsthand about the discovery of Cave 17 and the origins of the scroll that eventually came into his own possession. Dr. Rao Feng Huang then imparted this knowledge to his daughter, Rao Yai, decades later. In 1932, Dr. Rao was in his 50s and he must have given the scroll to his daughter to honor her esteemed English professor at Tsinghua University. The gift Rao Yai offered to Professor Billy therefore included not only the scroll fragments, but also her family's first-hand knowledge of its origins. She was sure to note this detail in her English letter to Professor Billy, offering that it came from a stone room at Dunhua. That description, as it turns out, was no mere flourish of expression. It was a statement of fact. We can now follow this manuscript's footsteps for 120 years, 1900 to 2020. Except for the top edge of the water damage, the scroll mostly survived intact. It evaded the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, the Sino-Japanese War of 1937. It survived 
Hawaiian humidity since 1938 for nearly 80 years, and the yellow dye insect repellent clearly repelled both Dunhuang bugs and tropical Hawaiian bugs alike. It traversed the epistemological realms from creation as a religious text to its reconceptualization as a worthy gift. It traversed geographic realms migrating from Dunhuang to Hubei to Beijing and eventually traveling from Honolulu to Seattle, where it reappeared to the public for the grand reopening of the Seattle Asian Art Museum in February earlier this year. The people and places that I have discussed today have already weaved quite a rich story, but I have actually only provided an outline, a mere framework for much future research and interpretation that remains to be done. There's still a lot missing in the story and perhaps some of it is never knowable. For example, what other pieces did the Rao family own? What happened to the scrolls in Paul Spengelt's collection? Another example of the unknowable, what sort of conversation uh, that had uh, occurred between father and daughter and what was the impetus that led Dr. Rao Honghuang to offer his father's scroll to his 20-year-old daughter, Rao Yai, in order to gift to her professor? I think this matter of offering a gift to acknowledge knowledge of its origins is very important. Indeed, I think the concept of gift giving is an idea that ties much of the story together. To serve as a gift, somebody made a decision to make two cuts on both edges, removing it from the rest of the scroll. At least, this was the fragment's first major transformation. The fragment then moved from collector to collector, from one place to the next, helping to navigate relationships between people, mediating between different owners and recipients. It was folded and refolded. It was mounted and unmounted to serve different purposes, from ease of transportation to storage to display. Now, I admired uh, Dr. Lewis Tythercott's reading list quite a bit, and I hope uh, some of you had a chance to skim the chapter that I sent along from her groundbreaking book, The Lives of Chinese Objects. I particularly appreciate her very detailed description of the misery of war, fighting and disease as historical background. And I offer this reading particularly to illuminate a contrast between the bronze Buddhist statues dislocated from Putuo Island by British soldier William Eady after the First Opium War, with the case of our manuscript fragments history of dispersal. In my mind, I can explicate more richly the circumstances of my manuscript fragments by borrowing from theories of gift psychology. And some of you might be familiar with the concept of reciprocity, the gift debt first proposed by French anthropologist and sociologist Marcel Mauss in 1925, that was then challenged by Annette Wiener's uh, keeping while giving the concept, the concept of inalienable possessions. The objects in social life with such indexical power that they cannot truly fully be given away. This fragment is at once an object of gift exchange, but for its origins in cave 17 also symbolically dense and indexical of the Morgao caves in 1900, no matter that we have forgotten about that accrued meaning until now. So thank you so much for listening to my detective story and some of my concluding thoughts. And I am eager and available now to take any comments and questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Ping. And uh, Julia is going to uh, be on with you in just a moment to um, uh, answer any questions. But uh, I just wanted to use this as a, a moment to thank all of you um, for, again, supporting the foundation's uh, virtual programming during this really quite unprecedented time. Uh, we've never experienced uh, anything quite like this in our 10 or 11 years of existence. And it really is with all the support of people like you uh, that we're able to uh, continue offering this programming to the public. Um, 
So actually just looking at a number of the attendees right now, we have a number of really fantastic donors. Uh, and I just wanted to use this opportunity right before Thanksgiving to thank all of you and to invite anyone else that might be interested in supporting the foundation's work to, to make a gift. Uh, you can do so quite easily via the Dunhuang Foundation website at dunhuangfoundation.us. Uh, and also we'll be sending out an email to all of you. We'll make it really simple and streamlined. Um, but uh, I think really uh, above all else, the person that I want to think at this very moment is our lecturer for this evening, Ping Fong. Uh, and uh, again, I can't think uh, an, enough, uh, thank her enough for being with us today. Um, she's a great friend of mine personally and also just somebody that I, I very much uh, enjoy having the chance to see when I'm in Seattle. And I respect her uh, dearly as, as a scholar as well. So uh, thank you again, Ping, for this. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Julia so we can get to everyone's questions. All right, Ping, thank you for that fascinating lecture. Uh, the compliments are rolling in as we speak, um, as are the questions. So I'll begin with some of our earliest questions from way back in the beginning of the talk. Um, of what materials were the scrolls made? Leather, papyrus, paper? I believe there are a variety, but the, the, the pieces that I am very particularly interested in are paper. Uh, and it is quite uh, a testament to the quality of the paper that they have so, survived quite this long in, in are in this good a shape. Um, but uh, if you look at them very closely, um, mm -hmm. such as I have done under a microscope, um, it is quite amazing uh, just how refined some of these things are. So for me, I've only looked, uh, my own personal experience is very limited to this, this one scroll. <laughs> uh, there are lots of people out there who study this uh, much more particularly. Um, uh, especially at the British Library. Um, there are many, there are several studies, I think, published about the paper. Uh, so not leather, um, but I'm not sure if there are any other pieces in the library cave that were of other materials. Um, I know there are, there are many other people out there who can answer that better than I. I can concur with you on the quality of the pieces. Um, when I worked at the Getty and they brought pieces from the British Library and they opened the cases, that was my mouth dropped open. I've never seen anything like that in mm -hmm. my life. Like the mm -hmm. quality, the condition is just astounding. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think we, it's very important to to have a comparison and to mm -hmm. understand it about is. quality. So there are different levels of quality. Um, right. So the, the smoothness of the paper and also the, the what it's made out of. So the, the bus, the fiber bus itself. So this is something I think which I'm hoping there are some specialists out there who will uh, take interest in this project and help me figure that out. Please, if anyone out there can help Ping, we're soliciting. Please, <laughs> we're soliciting aid. Email me. <laughs> um, we have another question um, about the objects. Um, May I know what is the dye used for preserving the sutra? Is it from a tree bark? Ah, uh, hi, Quincy. Uh, this is uh, my former student, Quincy Yan. Uh, honestly, Quincy, I really don't know. <laughs> uh, there are folks who study the different colorations, so there are have different tonalities, and it's pos it's quite possible um, that a variety of dyes could have been used. And, and you use the word dye, and I'm actually not entirely certain, but it sure, it sure it makes sense to call it a dye. Um, uh, I, I, I was wondering whether there would have been a scent to it, but to be perfectly honest, for the manus my manuscript, the only scent that I got from it was of mothballs when they first arrived <laughs> at my doorstep. And it was overwhelming, <laughs> so oh it was not possible to detect any other <laughs> beyond. I suppose due to the climate in Hawaii, it is fortunate they used the mothballs, even if it did have that exactly. rather unfortunate yes. so, lingering. Right, stuff. it needed a little bit of shoring up in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, we had a question. What was, uh, could you please repeat the title of the past Buddhist art exhibition at the Seattle Art Museum? Thank you. Oh. Yes, uh, thank you for your interest in that. Um, this was the, uh, let me get that right, <laughs> shall I? <laughs> um, the, uh, 
Journey to Dunhuang is the main title and the subtitle is Buddhist Art of the Silk Road Caves. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. okay. And was there a catalog released with that as well? Unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, but uh, the, uh, we did this in collaboration with the Princeton Art Museum. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, with a focus on the uh, three aspects of James and Lucy Lowe's uh, photographic and artistic practice, collecting artistic practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Bing. Um, we have a question about the manuscript, um, whether it, it being cut. Um, is this the full version of the sutra or is it in fragments? Mm -hmm. um, so the sutra does not survive in full. Um, as far as I can tell, um, we have those three early Dunhuang fragments, two in Japanese collection. One is in Otani, collect okay. the time. Uh, and then the third one, which is in the Stein collection from Oral Science Second Expedition. So the one that I showed uh, details of, that is the, the uh, one of the chapters. So there are three chapters, um, upper, middle, and lower chapters. Mm -hmm. And of these three chapters, we were able to cobble the three chapters together from these uh, surviving manuscripts. Otherwise, it was not known to us at all before the discovery of Cave 17. Mm -hmm. OK. Wow. Um, we have a question. Is the manuscript now stored at the Seattle M Art Museum? Uh, yes, it's actually displayed on the wall, except that unfortunately, <laughs> our museum has had to close. Um, right. We reopened in February and then mm -hmm. after, we, our, after our grand reopening, uh, we actually had to close because of the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. Right. Um, so uh, it's on the wall. <laughs> it's, um, and I wish I could show it to everyone. <laughs> everyone, if after the pandemic is over, please make a trip to see the Seattle Art Museum. Um, Ping is very modest about how beautiful the renovations are. I had the chance to see very it in fine. all its glory. It is, it is well worth the trip. If you are into um, sutras or art deco architecture or anything in between, you, I would strongly encourage you to go. <laughs> Come soon, because I don't know how long my conservator will, will allow me to keep the manuscript up. Oh, that's true here. with the light, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sooner rather than later. Um, we had a question. Uh, thank you for the amazing detective work. I'm wondering if your discovery might shed new light on the provenance of other possible Dunhuang scrolls in U.S. collections. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the question, Anne. Uh, all of my wonderful former students are showing up here. <laughs> um, I hope so. Um, I think that uh, provenance is a very fascinating way of studying objects. Um, and in the way that I think about it is, um, I don't really use the word provenance as much as I think of it as a biography uh, of particular works of art. So these ways that um, works of art move to use the uh, Kapitov and Apadurai terminology that they move through spheres of influence and interpretation, the different meanings that come to light as they uh, move through time. And so for me, I think that um, the, there are not that many Dunhuang objects, uh, manuscripts in US collections. There are really just a handful. Um, most of it is in Europe. Uh, so those works in, that are in the US, I think are highly understudied. So. Uh, I think that it's really worth paying attention to. But of course, this scroll, I had the, the little secret weapon, the little gift letter that really helped me just unlock the whole story uh, of its earlier, of its um, dispersal after uh, it left the Cave 17. So I think, uh, I feel that um, my work, um, on the young 20 year old Rao Yuai is correct. It seems to be an incredible coincidence uh, yeah. if it weren't her. <laughs> so I think that it would be, that that is, that is the uh, one turn that allows us to really establish very clearly 
as to uh, what happened uh, to the scroll after it left the cave. I dare say that this is a very unusual case. I think that it's much harder to study provenance in most cases. Mm -hmm. The fact that the gift letter was there made an enormous difference. And the fact that we have these amazing search engines today that allow us to, uh, to create uh, uh, you know, very precise searches. We had a question. Um, it was related to the cutting of the scroll, but mm -hmm. um, which we've answered. But the question was uh, the third portion was how are the pieces of the British Library script joined or not joined? Mm, yeah, very interesting. Um, so the edges um, in my conversations with other scholars um, seems are so important. Um, in the sense that it's whether two pieces of paper are joined together. Also, um, pieces of paper are of a certain size uh, after they are made. So there are number. So these transitions are incredibly important for dating uh, works of art. Right. So these works, these uh, manuscripts, uh, have their own material history. The the paper itself. Um, so. I don't believe, unfortunately, that the Seattle scroll has any of the original edges. So I believe that the, the, the edges were cut at some point rather than there was the original piece of paper um, and then joined. So we have only one original joint. So one seam that is actually still um, uh, is part of the fragment. So I think um, that is, um, you know, that is, an important uh, clue, but not as good as if I had an original paper edges, that would have been better. <laughs> uh, now the British Museum, the Stein collection uh, scroll, which because it's very, very long, I think that I need to take a trip to take a look at it and to check the seams um, that are on that scroll uh, under microscope, preferably. Um, so, uh, you know the. I think the. It's so important to pay very very close attention to all of these details. Um, so not just what is on the front side. So the quality of the back side. The mm -hmm. so um, uh, the front piece, front of the paper versus the back of the paper. Mm -hmm. So these are pretty clear materially speaking, uh, when in handmade paper. So uh, the comparison. I think I I dare say this comparison with the Stein scroll has just begun. It's very important to do much more work on it. Okay. We had a question, how did you label the scroll after all of these journeys and passages uh, in terms of who owned it? Mm. And thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's very complicated. <laughs> so I name it using, it's very, very long sutra, uh, the name of the sutra, which I, uh, read to you, and I name uh, I use both the original name in Chinese and its transliteration and its English translation. So wow. you can imagine this takes up most of my paper <laughs> already. Um, so yes, it's um, it's it's uh, it's an interesting. How, what kind of title do you give a work like this? As mm -hmm. far as ownership, well, I am offering you something literally hot off the press. Uh, this is the very first time I've presented any of this material. And I only just found out about this last month. So um, we'll see uh, how it affects how I describe this scroll. Mm -hmm. We're so privileged, Ping, to be the first people to hear the results of all oh, of Oh, no, research. no, the, really? the honor is all mine, honestly. <laughs> Oh, um, we had another question about this, the, the scroll. Was it cut? Yes, it was. Um, but what is the size of this piece? in terms of the dimensions. Um, don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, I believe it's about 27 centimeters tall. Okay. Yeah. So it's not huge. Mm, about this big. Okay. Yeah, about the width of my screen. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, someone is wondering, what is your plan for the next phase of your work after having conducted mm. this fascinating research? Mm-hmm. So um, I have, I think, achieved everything that I can achieve from my desk 
<laughs> using all the digital sources that are available to me on hand um, from my computer. <laughs> uh, I hope to one day have a two week stretch of time where I can spend in a cozy library with the 38 volumes published of Governor Rao Yingqi's every single telegram, every single note or memorandum he ever wrote is published in these 38 volumes. If there is something to be found, it will be there. So I, I think it's quite amazing that um, Governor Rao's second daughter and her husband um, managed, the family were, must have been pack rats because they kept everything and they donated these to a university and then the university published these documents. So they are a treasure trove. Um, we, we have uh, a few copies in the United States. Um, so I hope to one day have the time away from my duties as curator. Uh, either that, or if there are any enterprising uh, graduate students out there who want to help me, I can pay you. Please <laughs> contact me. <laughs> you happen to be at one of the institutions that have the governor's complete correspondence. Yeah, anyone at Berkeley, <laughs> please get in touch. There are a few people from Berkeley, so that might work. Um, this is an interesting question. Could this scroll possibly be a bribe rather than a simple gift? What political context of early 20th century Northwestern China could be related to the transmission of this scroll? Mm. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting use of the word uh, bribe, which is of course, um, it has certain negative connotations. Uh, of course, gift and bribe, well, sometimes it is difficult to distinguish mm. what somebody's uh, motives are in offering a quote unquote gift. That is certainly the case. Right. Um, so the, the interesting thing I think about um, this particular work of art, this particular manuscript is that uh, for me, it represents a larger practice of offering these manuscripts to local, that uh, the Abbot Huang had offered them to many local officials uh, for various purposes, obviously, um, besides the official route of going to the Lanzhou uh, Vice Regal Yamen. So the, the, I think what it, it does do is it makes us look again um, to all these uh, early names that we have of people who received or were received scrolls from one source or another. And I think that we know much less as to the scrolls that sort of travel westward to Xinjiang, not to Beijing or to other uh, parts of the uh, main part of China, but westwards. Uh, so uh, the, the whole um, Urumqi, <laughs> Uh, ecology of manuscript dispersal, I think it's very interesting to me. And uh, there are certainly um, other names who I have discovered also who own scrolls, who uh, were uh, Qing officials and or uh, members of the elite uh, who were of Urumqi, who uh, got their hands on these pieces. So I think that's, um, uh, it offers a, a way of thinking about these objects, besides the fact that um, Westerners came and bought them up and took them. Right. Mm -hmm. right, we hear very little about the transmission of the scrolls that did not go to France or to England. Yes. Right? So. Correct, so I feel that it's, um, it's a long time overdue to study. Mm -hmm. We have uh, um, two very different questions um, mm -hmm. asked by the same person, is the preservation of the paper due to the arid conditions in Dunhuang? Is the first question. And the second, will you do an article for orientations? <laughs> um, so the first question, um, yes, I think the, the arid conditions was very helpful in preserving these manuscripts in the ways that they have been preserved. But you, as you see the physically, uh, the, the effects of water damage. So, um, you know, for sure the dry air certainly helped it from deteriorating and turning to dust. 
but that didn't mean that there were uh, other issues, that, um, environmental issues that it suffered. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is about orientations. Um, I actually mentioned, uh, I wrote a little bit about this uh, scroll for orientations already in okay. uh, the reopening announcement of the Seattle Asian Art Museum that was published in May, June issue of this year. Um, but of course, that was a little bit before I had made all these discoveries. So um, I hope to certainly talk to more people and to do more work on uh, all my research. Uh, it's probably more than orientations wants to know about a scroll. Um, but my bibliography is already four pages long. So I think that this will end up being a, a I can, talk about it in different ways, both academically and also um, to announce it uh, more broadly in a venue such as orientations. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I look forward to reading that. Mm. Um, I had a question. Are there descendants of Rao I that are knowledgeable of the Sutra collection? You know, I would love to know. Um, so I, I uh, she died in Beijing in 1981, so presumably uh, somebody in the family must have known about this. And as I, I that's why I paid attention to um, the documents that were published uh, for, of the Governor Rao's, uh, all of his correspondences, because if this family takes such care with um, all of, of these documents, then surely uh, they might uh, remember um, the, uh, this scroll perhaps, or even other ones that were in the collection. So that would be really wonderful to find out more. Um, certainly, uh, I haven't got, taken that step yet, but uh, that would certainly made a lot of sense for the next step. Mm -hmm. Continue the research. Um, speaking of research, we have two questions left. The first is, did you use a specialized search engine or database in addition to Google? Oh yes, Google? absolutely. I used everything that I knew. So the for me, it was really amazing. Uh, well, not just Google, right? I used um, Baidu and mm -hmm. I used Chinese search engines in, in addition to Google. Um, and it's interesting that the, um, the source of results that come back to you uh, differ so greatly depending yeah. on what search engine you use. So one has to use everything. I also used all the uh, standard databases that I, uh, biographical databases that I had, I, I know about. Um, and I hope that somebody out there may know, uh, well, my area is sort of earlier China, medieval China, middle period China. So I know all those databases and I use all of them, but of course they're not going to include folks from Republican era. Right. Um, so I hope that those uh, of you out there who study Republican era China um, may know of other uh, engines, other databases where I can input some of my outstanding questions. Um, and I say this because um, it, I never held that much hope for the search engines, uh, the more official search engines, because the people that I'm searching for are 20 year old young women. Right. They generally are not recorded. Not recorded. Uh, so these, uh, these missing pieces, I think uh, it's really wonderful to be able to even find even traces of folks like them. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, we have one final question and I think it's a great way to summarize and sum up many of the issues we've been discussing. Um, how do you effectively present this sutra and other calligraphic works at the museum to a non-Chinese reading audience? Mm. Oh, William. Hi, Will. <laughs> hey, William. Uh, you asked me a very tough question, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting one to how to talk about uh, something that is visual, and yet it is also is semiotic. It has meaning that is beyond the visual. Um, so this is, uh, I would say that one size never fits all. So for example, um, I took a very, uh, I have a variety of approaches, so let's put it this way. So for this scroll, I displayed it within a room that talks about, um, uh, it talks about basically word and image in uh, mm. Chinese uh, and other Asian, uh, Japanese, Indian and Jain and Islamic works that relates to texts 
So both narratives and also this type of sutra texts that are of more of a, a religious practice nature. Yeah. Um, so that context, I emphasize the function, the original function of this scroll as a um, confession rites, uh, a manual. But in another room, when I teach, uh, I emphasize a completely different thing. There's a, we have this amazing, a wonderful scroll, a uh, calligraphy scroll written by Wen Zhengming. And the Wen Zhengming scroll, uh, I figure I can emphasize something very different. So this Wen Zhengming scroll, of course, I have my usual la curatorial label text. I explain, you know, what he's uh, thinking about in writing this poem and the way that he's writing it. But in that particular example, I also include the Chinese transcription. So the Chinese characters are placed a little bit below so that somebody can follow along character by character according oh. to the transcribed words. So I made a very conscious decision to include the Chinese but not an English translation. So in my mind, that I think should signal to somebody that actually the visuality of how you express one character in a handwritten calligraphy is more important than perhaps what the words say. Although, of course, both are important. But I would say that it is a matter of how to emphasize one thing or another. And I, I think uh, I know that you are teaching now when your students um, um, might have particular preferences. But uh, I uh, get in touch with me, uh, email me, and I can tell you what my my uh, favorite ways to engage uh, uh, university students is separately. That's so kind of you, Ping. And I cannot thank you enough um, for this whole presentation, your generosity in answering our questions and just sharing this mystery story, this detective story of the scroll and its journeys um, from Dunhuang to Seattle with all of us. Um, it's really a tribute to your scholarship that you were able to piece this together in the way that you did. And especially being confined to your desk, literally under lockdown while all of this was happening. So um, thank you, we really cannot thank you enough. Well, I, I hope that um, I provided a little bit of entertainment today. <laughs> Uh, it certainly kept me, this project certainly kept me very entertained in this last two months, I have to say. Your enthusiasm is palpable, we can tell. <laughs> it clearly carries through the screen. Um, I'd like to thank everyone else for joining us tonight um, for this fascinating presentation here at the beginning of our holiday season. Um, we greatly appreciate your support. And we'd like to ask you to join us again on December 10th, also a Thursday, also at 7 p.m. Eastern. We will have a lecture, the next in our series, um, Icons in Silk, Images of Power, Art, Politics, and Tibetan Buddhism on the Silk Road and Beyond, which will be given by our Carl Debresny, who is the Senior Curator of Collections and Research at the Rubin Museum in New York. Um, Carl will discuss the intersection of politics, religion, and art in Tibetan Buddhism and the central role that the Silk Road played in its development and spread across the empires of North Asia. Uh, also, I'd like to briefly mention on the 17th of December, we are going to have a chamber music concert with music from the Silk Road. So stretching from Western Europe th through to uh, Tang Dynasty China, and um, the Middle East, we'll have a Turkish oud player. We're going to cover a lot of regions in this uh, celebration of the music of the Silk Road. That will be on December 17th, also a Thursday, also at 7 p.m. Uh, more information on both these events is forthcoming. Uh, until then, uh, we're very much looking forward to you joining us in the future for these events. And I wish you all a happy beginning to the holiday season and a very good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.